What's up? It's Way Up with Angela Yee. I'm Angela Yee, and I have a special guest here who we've been trying to coordinate for quite some time. Arian Simone is here. She is the co-founder and general partner of Fearless Fund, and you may have seen this in the news, but this is a message that we have to keep on making sure that we're elevating, highlighting, not forgetting about, and that it stays in the news. So can you let people know what the Fearless Fund is who are listening? Most definitely, and thank you for having me, because you're correct. We have been trying to get this going. Mm -hmm. The Fearless Fund is the nation's first venture capital fund that is built by women of color for women of color. We are investors. It looks like Shark Tank. People come, they pitch, they want funding for their business. We say, hey, we'll give you $500,000 in exchange for 10% equity ownership. Um, that's what it looks like on, I guess you would say, high level surface. Everybody has the reference of Shark Tank. They know what that is. Right. Now... More, I guess we say, under the hood, we're backed by J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, MasterCard, PayPal, and a lot of major Fortune 100 and 500 corporations. We have deployed about um, maybe somewhere around $30 million of investment capital. And these raised... are companies that you know of that you guys have invested into that our listeners would oh, definitely be yes. quite familiar with. I have the lip bar on right now. Oh, me too. We... <laughs> You do. We both are I thought she did. <laughs> yes, we're investors in the lip bar. We're investors in Slutty Vegan. We're I just investors did a deal with them. Partake. Yes. <laughs> See, a partake I love. Okay. So I mean, the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. If somebody were to look at all the hot women of color startups, we dominate the list. Okay. Prior to the Fearless Fund, the average fundraise a black woman had was around thirty thousand dollars. Compared to the now, way, yeah. now that the Fearless Fund exists, we came on the scene cutting seven figure checks to Amazing. black and brown women. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's been life changing, and these women are kicking butt. As you know, these companies, these are people who are in like eight figure revenue, gr massive growth year over year, and they are doing amazing. And then August 2nd, I wake up to what I thought was a regular day in Atlanta, very sunny, just beautiful. We are plastered all over the news about a lawsuit that I know nothing about. So I was just completely shocked, like, what is going on? And I told my staff, hey, if this is real, find me the, the lawsuit because it has to be public. This mm -hmm. is not like a secret. It's a federal filing. And lo and behold, they pulled it up and it said United States on there. And I was like, we have a federal court case. You that guys. is all right. And what is this case? We are being sued by... Edward Bloom's organization, he is a conservative legal strategist. He's the same person that stopped affirmative action at the colleges in June of 2023 at the Supreme Court level. And he has a company called American Alliance for Equal Rights. They are alleging exactly that we are being discriminatory. I caught the whole eye. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I guess we have like reverse discrimination or reverse racism they're trying to For trying to help of. an underserved group of people who deserve the funding exactly. get the funding that they need. Okay. Because we all know that I think the biggest issue that black women have when we are starting our businesses is that we get the least amount of funding even though we start the most businesses. That is correct. So how do you remedy that? The Fearless exactly. Fund. So <laughs> that's and that was the Fearless Fund was created to help solve a problem because that is a problem. It's a very big problem. Women of color make over 20 percent of the U.S. population while receiving only 0.39 percent of the funding. Yeah, that's a fraction of a percent. That's what he should be focused on. Black, Why is it like that? You know, exactly. And black women in particular receive even less than that. Like you said, while being the fastest growing entrepreneurial demographic, it is absurd. I couldn't even believe. I was like, wait, alleged discrimination. When we were in court, one time the plaintiff side said what they are doing is like what the whites only side, what sign was in segregation. I said, oh, no, sir. <laughs> that sign was one meant to oppress. I said, and two, what disparity was that solving? Exactly. I said, we are solving a disparity. I said, now, where we can't agree is that you want a world where race doesn't matter. I want a world where race doesn't matter, too. But we have not gotten to that point yet. And anytime you take race consciousness out of things, race gets left behind. Right. So right now we have to be intentional in order to solve this problem. Because we see a lot of things under tech, like you talked about affirmative action in schools, right? We're going to see the results of that, you know, in the years to follow, mm -hmm. because that's going to have such an adverse effect on things that have been 
able to happen. You know, we already know how much. And people will say, oh, I don't see race. Racism doesn't exist anymore. You guys got to get over it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But we all know that is in my position, we all know that is not the case. No, it's right? not the case at all. And so if you're willing to give back all the land that you took and property that you took and make sure that uh, black all, all people are getting the equal amount of funding based mm-hmm. on the percentage that they make up in the United States, and that makes sense to me. If you want to say, okay, the only to me, that's a solution, but I don't see him coming up with that type of solution. Oh, no. He's yeah. not coming up with any yeah, type of solution all. at all. Um, which was very interesting. Something else to me that was interesting that was posed in court because the judges were trying to get to the to the root. Are you not liking how they are marketing? Are you mad that it basically exists, period? Right, right. And it was definitely on the both end. And I was just like, whoa. Uh, so what is going on now? Like, where is this case at yes. now? Yes, okay. So August 2nd, they filed three things against four of my legal entities they filed a temporary restraining order i thought those were on people not on businesses yeah they tried to put us out of business by august 17th that was withdrawn they filed a preliminary injunction on one of our grant programs with mastercard and they filed the complaint which is the case itself so we have yet to go to court actually on the case itself the complaint we've been to court on the preliminary injunction we won in the federal district court in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. They appealed immediately right after. So we have been in federal appeals court. We recently just did a court appearance for oral arguments on January 31st, 2024 in federal appeals court. And we're, we went before a three judge panel and we are waiting for them, which is a crucial time right now, to rule on this. OK, we need them to rule in our favor. And what can people who are listening do? Like, how can people participate or make sure they amplify yes. this message? Or is there a way? Because I can imagine also the funding that should be going towards these businesses is now going towards legal bills. It is going towards everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't say towards the businesses. So that's technically like these different pots. There's an investment pot. It's our management company pot where the investment dollars like a 2% or 2.5% flows over to for us to operate. Mm-hmm. That is, I would say, receiving like the biggest impact. Okay. Um, we do have one of our attorney law firms that is pro bono. Thank right. God. They've been a blessing. <laughs> thank God. Because um, the bills, boy, they add. But there are is, others yeah. that are not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there are also communication agency fees and travel fees and so many other things that come about. Um, it has impacted fundraising. We would have normally had closings by now. We have not. So then that money from the closings then falls over to the operations. And it hasn't. Normally it would be having that funnel effect of the 2% or 2.5%, but it hasn't during this time. So, yeah, so you're talking about more going out, less coming in. So right. we have got to fix that. How are the companies that you've been working with, like a JP Morgan Chase and a MasterCard, how are they... Uh, feeling at this time as far as support because clearly they're invested. We are working through all those relationships. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, because um, I think that's important too. It is. It's very Because important. I feel like a lot of these companies do try to reach our audience and try to figure out, okay, how can we make sure we are in business? And, you know, there was a period of time when everybody was screaming out about diversity. June 2020. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that energy continues. Of course. Mm -hmm. The energy of the racial reckoning of 2020, it seems like there's a lot of opposition towards that in this atmosphere. So we have charged all of our corporate partners what do you plan to say in this moment and what do you plan to do with your dollars? Because you guys were very vocal around that time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how they choose to show up, but we have definitely been working through those relationships. And Erin, even just starting this fund, the Fearless Fund, I want to know how that happened because people need to understand your background and why you've been able to pull in these relationships. Ooh. Um, Born and raised Detroit, Michigan. Okay. (laughs) I know you have investments Okay, there. lip bar. <laughs> yes, born in, and I think it's just entrepreneurship is in our blood. Mm-hmm. We grew up in a city, if you're around my age, it was in the 80s and 90s, and it was 88% African American. And the mayor at the time, Mayor Coleman Young, he made sure that the contracts in the cities matched the demographics to mm-hmm. a T. So we got to see a lot of black wealth. So I've always dreamed big, and I've always been a dreamer. 
I had the lemonade stand as a kid by high school, middle school. I was selling poinsettias by high school. I was selling Mary Kay by college. I had, <laughs> you did Mary Kay. Okay. I sure did. As a, And I was underage, technically. <laughs> but yes, by college, I had a 2,500 square foot mall based retail store and I was raising capital for the first time ever. And I remembered what that experience was like. And I was sitting on the floor before the opening. And I said, Arian, don't worry about this investor landscape. Because one day you're going to be the business investor you were looking for. Right. And it looks like the fearless fund today. In between that time, I did start a PR marketing firm that Mm -hmm. I ran. And then now I run this venture capital firm. But I would say the relationships, they've just been built over time. Mm -hmm. But I encourage anybody who's raising children, just when they have those fundraisers for the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, those popcorn things everybody texts you about, can you donate to my child's popcorn this? I got a couple of those just now. I believe it. Yeah. (laughs) And I always tell them this, tell your child to ask me. Yeah. My mother empowered me, but she didn't enable me when it came to fundraising. She would let me have her contact list, but she said, you have to make the ask. Okay. And it made me very comfortable as an adult now being making the ask. You're right about that because for me right now, being an entrepreneur, one of the hardest things for me is asking for money or trying to raise capital. I haven't, I haven't really done that yet. You know, and I understand from uh, how important capital is to a business because a lot of times we're starting our own businesses, Mm -hmm. putting our own money into it, borrowing money. And a lot of us don't even have people that we can necessarily borrow money from because we also don't want to destroy those relationships, you know, Mm -hmm. with our friends and family. And so one of the main obstacles, I feel like there's there's a lot of ways you can educate yourself on how to run a business, which is important also. But capital, I feel like, has been one of the biggest obstacles. How do we have access uh, to capital? And so that's why the Fearless Fund has been, I feel like, a godsend for so many people Mm -hmm. who have said that they've been able to get uh, funding through you guys. Yes, and they're doing amazing. I mean, we work in the space of wealth creation, job creation. Like, these women are soaring. Like, our portfolio is popping. Yeah. And I'm like, if the only color you're looking at is green, this is worth the investment. (laughs) So we're also having a lot of discussions now with individuals, high net worth individuals, um, family offices, diversifying our LP base, which is our investor base. So it's not all heavy corporates. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, no, there are people out here who believe in what this is and who would want to make the money off of this mission, too. But you also asked something earlier I forgot to answer was... What can the people listening do about all of what's going on in this space? And there are a few things. One, if you want to support us, you can definitely donate to our foundation. We definitely have to stay in business to be in business. (laughs) There is that, um, which we have a foundation and we have our investment vehicle. So you can always donate to the foundation. It's in a tax write off. Also, we have a rally coming up that we are doing on March 14th, and people can check out our Instagram at fearless.fund for any of our events, our town halls, rallies, for them to come in large numbers to physically participate. Um, Our petition is fearlessfreedomnow.org. They can definitely sign it to put their signature to say, hey, we stand with the Fearless Fund. Um, Anything else, make sure you tell your... Congress people and even your state legislators, what is going on? Because right now, five states, I think, have made it illegal for DEI. Because I saw an article where the governor of Utah signed with five other states to make it illegal. And you know what? And I said this because I I was talking about you because you're one of the closers for Mm -hmm. time. And Shade Muhammad was here. And I was talking about DEI. And people have this misperception of DEI as something where unqualified people just get in to fill a quota, but that's not what it is at no. all. It is qualified, sometimes overly qualified people who are giving, yes. um, who have earned these positions and should have them. But a lot of times, people who are mediocre get an opportunity because they know somebody or you know, you're familiar with somebody whose skin color is the same as yours and you feel more comfortable hiring that person. But there are plenty of qualified people who have actually come and taken the reins of some of these businesses and produced, like, nothing you've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure people understand DEI is not like fill a quota. That's not what it is. Not not at all. DEI is definitely not that. Affirmative action isn't even that. I'm just, and I'm over all of this becoming convoluted. I was like, right after the affirmative action ruling, all the Fortune 100s, they started getting threatening letters to stop their DEI programs. I was like, I'm trying to figure out how the two are even correlating. What does that have to even do with this? 
So a lot of our investors started receiving threatening letters but right before we even got sued. That's crazy. Yes. And it says, think about the trickle-down effect of something like this, because people are watching this case. Oh, yes. To and see you what's to going be, to happen. Oh, because let me tell you, what, when those five states made DEI illegal, either way, we know what the goal is of the people that are basically suing us. They want what we do to be illegal. Right. That is why this case is so important, because it's setting precedents. It is a baseline case. We are inaugural defendants in one of the most defining lawsuits of our time. Everybody needs to know. So another thing people can do is awareness. But you do need to let your state legislators and your Congress people know because they are trying to make this illegal. They are using law right now, Section 1981 of the 1866 Civil Rights Act, to say we're violating this law. Which is not true. Mm-hmm. That law says that non-white people can enter into contracts. It was designed for black people post-slavery to have economic freedom and employment. And they are saying we are in violation of this. This is very critical because they are trying to make it illegal for us to do what it is that we do. But if we shut down, that means everybody shuts down. Yeah, because now you can't give grants to like a black owned business if that's one of, I mean, that's ridiculous. But what it shows is how scared People mm-hmm. are. It is. It's right. definitely fear. Yeah, it shows. It shows fear, and so we're fearless. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is the most important thing that we're discussing right here. But that's why people need to pay attention because it is going to affect a lot of this funding and a lot of things that are happening right now. And it does all tie in, like you said, with affirmative action, with DEI, mm-hmm. with everything that's going on. And studies have actually shown that companies that have diverse leadership function outperform. and outperform any other company. Oh, yeah. And Even so, returns. Mm-hmm. Diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams by like 30%. It's just good money. It's good right. business. Yeah. If, even if you don't care about anything else. Mm-hmm. Okay. It makes sense financially for your business. Well, Arian, and the, the rally that you guys are having on the 14th, is that in D.C.? Yes, it is. All right. I was telling, I thought so. I'm telling Jasmine Brand, all right, you're in D.C. You need to be out there. Oh, <laughs> thank then, you. So I told her already. But everybody that's in D.C., make sure that you're there if you're in the surrounding area. If you can make it out there, make it happen. Tamika Mallory called me, too. And she was oh, like, wonderful. Angela, we got to make this happen. I was like, Tamika, I'm on it. Like, we're already working on both ends. But it is important to me because I am a founder and I am a person that I do want to be able to be in the position that you're in. That's why I'm right now trying to build up myself and my business and my money to help other businesses. But I want to make sure that I'm able to give my money to those businesses that deserve it the most that don't have the funding that everybody else does. And you are doing amazing. Thank you. (laughs) No, you are. But I appreciate you. This means a lot to me personally. So, Arian Simone, how can people find you? How can they find the Fearless Fund one more time? Fearless Fund is at fearless.fund, and I'm at Arian Simone on all social media. All right, then. Thank you so much for coming through. I know you're super busy, but we're going to keep on following up with this. So anytime, like, love to have you come up here and discuss the work that you're doing. And I want to say I know it's not easy. And so I know it could be really, really stressful for you. So I'm just giving you all my love and support. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all thank right. You so it's way much. up. Way up.